All right, welcome to the show. This is the guest, Chris Dunn. What's up, man? Hey, man. Thanks so, for having me. So the reason I have you on, so Chris is one of the few people I know who's been a trader that is not poor. Because um, <laughs> I know a lot of those that get really into day trading and all that kind of stuff and goes poor. You're also one of the few people I know that talks about crypto in a pretty normal fashion. Yeah. And is not like maximalist on anything like that. So I'm I was, a profit maximalist. There you go. I anything that can that. make money. Yeah. And I think you, I don't know what your thoughts are about Warren Buffett, but you seem to have like this combo of like Warren Buffett slash day trader in you. Well, so I used to be a day trader for like many years from 02 to like 2013. That was like my primary thing. And then the markets changed and now nobody makes money day trading. Like day trading is dead. There used to be trading floors on Wall Street with day traders. Yep. They don't exist anymore. So anything you see on social media that talks about like how to make money day trading, it's all bullshit. The only people making money day trading are manipulating markets. Yeah, I mean, I remember like in college because I graduated, I went to college around 2001 or so. And I was into day trading because in high school, me and a group of friends would go on Yahoo Stock Simulator and they give you a million dollars, of course, fake. Yeah. And so I was throwing around 100 grand here, 100 grand there. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. This is pretty awesome. But then quickly, once I had a little bit of my own spare cash, I put money in and it was a vastly different game. When I had $60 on a stock and it went up 2%, I was like, I'm rich. I'm the smartest person in the world. <laughs> and when it dipped at all, I was like, my life is going to end. Yeah. And so I got that uh, experience early, but I think everyone goes through that phase where you're like, wait, if I buy this stock here and it goes up here, I made this much money. Yeah. Every, I think I think at least every male I've met goes through this phase at least once. Yeah. And mo most people do it and they lose or they realize like, holy shit, this is really hard. And they become obsessed with it and they either make it a career or they never touch it again. It's one of those things where like, it sounds like day trading sounds like a bad idea to a lot of experienced people. But at theory, if you do buy a stock at this level and then sell it at this level, you make money. Yeah. So let, let's be clear with like definitions. Like what day trading is, is when you go in and you buy and sell a whole bunch in the span of one day. And, you know, we call it scalping or like short term trading where you're trying to get in and out. That used to work because the markets were a lot less efficient. There was no, you know, high frequency algorithms. But after the 08 financial crisis, every year the volatility was going down and the competition with algorithms was picking up. And so all the profits in those short term moves got competed away. Mm. So the way to make real money as a trader or an investor um, is swing trading or position trading, like j basically just holding for longer periods of time. And I make the case that if you're in the markets at all, you are a trader. The only question is, is what is your trade frequency? Even if it's somebody who like just buys the S&P 500 and holds, you're still doing the actions of a trader and you still need to have the same skill set. It's just a lot less frequent. Oh, that's it. That's a great point. So I am a trader. Yeah. I have stocks. I don't actively trade. I don't, I don't know what it's going to do next year. But, but you buy, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I think Apple in two years will likely make more profit than it does right now. Yeah. I, yeah. I make the argument that trading and investing, at least in the stock market or the crypto markets, um, they're the same thing. You're, all you're doing is making buying and maybe selling decisions. Um, you're either doing that, you know, in the span of one day or the span of a, a career or a lifetime, if you're, you know, putting it in a retirement account. Um, but yeah, if, if you're buying and selling any financial instrument, you are applying the skills of a trader. I mean, because if you look at, if you tra track your net worth and look at it over time, it says like, oh, there's like a 4%, 7% increase. And the way you get those increases is in the stock market, yeah. right? That's how people do it. Yeah. You're making decisions about when to buy and when to sell. And you're either, you know, you can do different types of strategies like dollar cost averaging, where you're not trying to quote unquote time anything, but you are setting up your own rules-based approach for when to buy, um, or you're trying to use a combination of either technical analysis or fundamental analysis or market cycles or market sentiment. That, that's what I love about the markets is like you within the law, like you can buy and sell based on anything that you make up, any reason that you see. And I, I think most people just do it based off of motion, which is why most people underperform the markets. And the mass majority of people lose their money to a small percentage of people that are consistently profitable over time. Uh, so, so there's people like you that somehow like this stuff. You seem like a numbers guy. You always have been. I don't know if it's just like a quirk of like your education or just how you are, but 
how the fuck is someone supposed to just normally figure this out? Like, I always wonder, like the average person, like the average of 350 million Americans or something, how do they know this stuff? They don't. I mean, most people are completely ignorant. Like the the education system doesn't teach us anything. Um, and a lot of the stuff, the education, the YouTube videos, the stuff that you see out there about investing or trading is just complete bullshit. Um, so there, there's a huge lack. And that's why, you know, I've been doing YouTube videos for a long time. That's why we have the wealth building community to try to teach people the right way how to approach it. Huh. So you have like a community where people, you, okay, you teach people that's cool. So I think yeah. they're learning from people like you, but I've seen a lot of people that go down the wrong road with investing. I've seen like the people that they take advice from and it's, it's terrible. And I'm just like, I think this is the only avenue for people to learn. Like the government doesn't tell you what to do with your money at all. No, no. I mean that it, it's, it's crazy. Like I was lucky enough whenever I was in high school, I was working in a mortgage company and I saw a guy who was day trading and so I, I got started young. I got addicted young. And with, with, but without that experience, I, I don't know, you know, maybe I would have had a 401k and a, a regular job, but it, it's not something that is even taught like the, the basics. I guess. So I guess in like yesterday, the last generation where they had jobs for their entire lives, where that was typical, what would happen is the investing would be handled by your company. Right. Yeah. But by your whatever the company's wealth advisor reform or something like that. Yeah. So you instantly just kind of bought into what they were doing. And they were probably smart enough to say, like, like let's put in a pretty stable thing over time. You're not gonna have the best return in the world, but you'll get six percent a year averaged over 30 years. Which yeah. Is pretty great. But you know what's crazy? So my wife, Nikki, she's a, a CFP, a certified financial planner. Mm -hmm. And she talks to people all the time that have 401ks that are sitting in cash. They're not even invested in the market. They're they're like putting money in this 401k account and they think it's invested, but they don't even know, like, how do you buy the S&P 500 or what are the funds that are available? That's the average level of education that's out there. People just don't know. I, I mean, I have talked to very smart people. I'm talking like engineers, programmers and stuff like that, that like don't get inflation. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they understand the concept, like they understand what it is, but they're just like, what's wrong with letting stuff sit in the cash forever? Yeah. Like you're supposed to have a bunch of cash. And you're like, yeah, but every year that cash goes down. A hundred dollars barely buys us a lunch together anymore. Yeah. Whereas I remember even as a kid, you had a hundred dollars. I mean, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. You could go fill up a tank of gas, you do all sorts of stuff. And it kind of pisses me off actually that like most people aren't aware of this. And I actually, do, I actually don't think it's their job to know all this. Mm -hmm. I think your job should be like, if you work at the telephone company to go repair telephone lines, that should be your job. And like money is automatically taken care of. Well, so I don't think everybody needs to be like a professional trader or a professional investor, but I do believe that like, if, if you want to be financially free, like it, it's your own responsibility to learn the basics and to, to try to take control of that and to be like sovereign in a way where, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to just rely on some investment advisor to tell you what to buy and sell. Like to me, I, I love it. So it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, even if you're an, a W2 employee or an entrepreneur and you're busy and you're like, I don't want to be in the markets all day, you should at least know what you're doing and why. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I guess that's fair. I, it, it, it is just like a maddening thing that like so much of our lives has to go towards this. Although you could argue that like, I think I've probably made more from investing than I have from business. I think. Mm. I, and it's, and it's been a lot simpler. Yeah. Like, uh, I remember I published my entire portfolio, uh, one time as a tweet and that went really, and I po uh, posted my inflation protection kit. And the funny thing is I posted that when inflation was really high, that was a topic, but I was like, this has been my same play for the last 10 years. And it, it's been something like, it's like Apple, Google, basically all the bare metal internet stocks, mm -hmm. Apple, Google, Microsoft kind of fang kind of stuff. And so you buy those individual stocks. I, bu I bought those individual stocks. Uh, and then Tesla's also on there. And then also, uh, uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And that's the whole thing. That's the entire plan. And like, to me, I'm just like, how come no one says like, what if you just bought these things? That would be good. I guess the closest thing out there is Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. He talks about it. Just buy the S&P 500. Uh, was it SPY or something? Is that one of those? Mm -hmm. SPY yep. or the one I buy called VOO. It's the same thing. Yep. I taught, there, there's like several tickers that represent the market as a whole. Yeah. And like most people would be better off just buying that and dollar cost averaging over time. By dollar cost averaging, you mean buy every month. Yeah. What, Automatically what, buy a hundred bucks a month forever and never sell it. Yeah. You, you choose the amount, you choose the time frequency. It could be a dollar a day. It could be a thousand a month. We, you know, make it, d choose what that can fit into your budget, but then stick to it and don't get scared out because what a lot of people will do is they'll get excited when the markets are high and they'll, they'll pile in at the top. And then when the markets are down 
and CNBC's freaking out and everybody's losing their minds, they'll they'll pull back or they'll sell when they really should be doing the opposite of what's comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you pick a DCA strategy, like stick to it. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, in the financial markets, I've heard people say this stuff, but I think the way, and coming from a copywriter, I always go, they're using buzzwords, like dollar cost averaging. You know what that means. I get what it means. But at the same time, if I was a uneducated person about finance or dollar cost averaging, it sounds like some financial strategy, some crazy strategy. And in reality, it means you set an automatic buy every month. It could be for 10 bucks of stock, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Yep. But that way you're not exposed to all the risk. And so what I've told people in the past that's really helped people get on the right track is I go, I pers every month I buy VOO, like whatever month that it just, just it's automatically triggered. Yep. That's it. That's the whole thing. And in fact, if you were Warren Buffett giving investing advice, I think that's what he says. Yeah. Just dollar cost average, one of those index funds or whatever, VOO, SPY, one of those ticker th symbols. And that's the whole damn thing for your life. Yeah. I mean, that, that alone, if you do that consistently, that will potentially give you oh, financial freedom. Don't touch it. That's yeah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't screw it up. Don't mess with it. Don't, yeah. don't think like this month I should buy it. This month I shouldn't buy it. The whole point is to do it automatically. Yeah. Fortunately, we have computers that do that for you. Yep. Uh, and there's different levels to the game, right? Like that is the most simple level is buy and don't screw it up and just let it compound over time. And then if you enjoy the, I, I gamify it. I, I enjoy investing. I enjoy, you know, hunting for the next big thing, the next trend, mm -hmm. the next, you know, that's how I found Bitcoin super early. Like I just love looking at the world and asking the question, like what is going to be huge that nobody is thinking about right now? And Oftentimes, that's where you can really juice your returns instead of just getting the, you know, the S&P, um, you know, 10% nominal returns a year. Like I've been able to way, way, way outperform that just by gamifying it. And it's, it's a competition, right? It's like the markets are a competitive arena. And if you're a competitive person and, and you want to put the time in and you truly enjoy it, then I would encourage anybody who wants to to find out who they truly are to, to trade the markets because you can't hide from yourself. You can't hide from fear, greed, all that stuff. Dude, I, the best thing I ever did in college was try day trading. Yeah. And, and, and the reason was, I think I could make small mistakes back then when I was in college versus like playing around with like 401k or whatever in the future. That would, that would be a big mistake. I've seen people do that and they lose a lot of their money. And you're like, man, if they just did this earlier and lost $600 to learn the same lesson, right? it would have been so much better when they were playing on a small scale. What would you say is like one of the most important lessons you took away from that? I was waking up when the bell rang. I like, I'm not a morning person, but I was like, I'm going to wake up when the bell rings at 8 a.m., 7 a.m., whatever. And I would like watch the, the thing go up and down. And then you'd be like, oh, it's going up. It's going down. And I thought like that was a big deal. And then you watch CNBC or one of those, uh, programs and they're always just like, oh my God, everything's amazing today. And then the next day, like everything's going to go downhill. The United States is going to crumble. It's like literally when you watch that over and over, you're like, wait a second, are they telling me the truth? What's, what's going on over here? And it's just like, they just have to fill 24 hours a day exactly. with some guy talking about something. They have to get clicks and views. That's and it, ha it has to be outrageous. And if it's really boring, like anytime it's a boring interview, I'm like, click, I don't want to watch it. But anytime they're like, it's going to go, going to go under. And then, then you're watching. And so I started, I started learning that, that I'm like, oh, they're kind of just doing this for entertainment purposes. Yeah. And I learned that like, this is not reality. Right. And they're also talking about like, oh, it, like, my favorite is like, uh, let's say like Elon Musk makes a tweet and Tesla goes down 2% in a day. I'm like, but that's normal. That's just the normal everyday swing of things. Yeah. Like the, there, there's no different on this day than that another day. The, the typical headline is insert asset goes up or down for insert reasons. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it's every day they do it, right? It's, it's Tesla went down because Elon sneezed on SNL or, yeah. <laughs> you know, like they, 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 they say it as if there was a single reason why it happened. And, and it sounds smart and people go, oh, I want to know why the, the stock market went down today. Click. And it's never that simple. And if you try to trade or invest based on those articles, you're going to be on the wrong side of the market. Yeah, because it's just like the madness of people is what's dictating that kind of stuff. Absolutely. The, the first, and I think I've told you this story, but the first time I ever made a lot of money from a Warren Buffett style thing, Dynegy, which is a company that was related with Enron, got hit with a $2 billion fine. They started paying it down $600 million a quarter, which is all of their profit. They dedicate 100% of their profit to paying down their fine, which I thought if, if you got a credit card bill and you had to pay it down, that would be good that you're spending all your money to pay it down quickly, right? That's a good thing. In the news, they got slaughtered and their stock went from like $35 to 35 cents, some crazy thing like that. And I remember reading the, the, the financials and I was like, but 
They're making zero profit because they're paying down a fine. Nothing changed about the company. Just one dingbat executive did something stupid yeah. and they got billed. And so I was like, but they're the same company. What is going on? Why is the stock so low? So I put my money where my mouth is. I put a bunch of money, a couple thousand bucks, which was a tremendous sum for me at the time when I was in college. And um, it went up like 12X when it got announced that they were profitable again. And I was like, you idiots. Like, it, like, how is this not common knowledge? And you look at all the articles and they're like, Dynagy is going to go downhill. It sucks, da, da, da. They're yep. the next Enron. But you're like, did anyone even read their just regular annual report <laughs> that I just got for free off of Yahoo? That's like, so no smart, one, man. No one read it. And then I was just like, oh. And then when I started graduating from school, I knew for friends that went to go work for the Wall Street Journal. I was like, this dude's never traded in his life. <laughs> He's the one that I'm reading? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I don't, I don't want to read from him. Yeah. And that's when I read, it was 23, I realized it was 23 year old idiots writing these article, articles that had no business. They're, they're a newspaper reporter. They're not trading a lot of money. And so I was like, I'm never going to listen to these people. I yeah. do my own research on this stuff. That's so smart. I mean, and and look, like uh, there those types of scenarios happen every day. And to me, that's what I love is like uncovering those things where it's like, it's so obvious yet everybody misses it. Those are oftentimes the most profitable things to get into. I'll give you an example. Like, um, Nikki, she, she trades, um, most, a lot of like retail stocks. Mm -hmm. So like Lulu, Ulta, um, Abercrombie and Fitch, stuff like that. And she, she understands those companies deeply. Several years ago, like Lululemon had this, uh, this, problem where the CEO came out and said like something about fat chicks or like they shouldn't be wearing our clothes and they, they had some like see-through pants. I forget exactly what happened, but the stock was down like 50% and Nikki was like, yeah, this is a, a huge overreaction, bought the low and then she's been riding it ever since. So finding those things where it's like, everybody's fearful and like nobody understands. And when you see something that's so clear and you put your money, that's oftentimes where you'll get the biggest gains. I, I remember, I mean, we talk about Bitcoin every once in a while and, and, and in the beginning it was like, you know, fake magic money. Mm -hmm. And I read Reddit. I'm a, I'm an active Redditor. And whenever I see people talking about the memes and stuff like, like Bitcoin going up and stuff, I'm like, okay, everyone's paying attention right now. I could tell. And then whenever I'm just like, Hey, whatever happened to Bitcoin? Like I never heard anything from it on Reddit. I'm just like, oh, the price is really low. Yep. And I'm just like, okay, if my hypothesis for the future is correct, then this is the time to like spend a little bit more money to buy. Like this is a dip we're in right now. Yeah. And then when it's riding high, of course, there's an article a day about it, right? Oh yeah. I mean, when, when price is low, everybody's writing obituaries and, and why it's dead and it's not coming back. When price is high, everybody's writing articles like why everybody's getting hilariously rich except you. Sorry. It, <laughs> it is the most emotion driven market I've seen ever. Like it's so speculative. It's the most volatile asset. It's been the, the best compounding asset since its inception. So it, it's just, it's a masterclass in so many areas of finance and trading. I was trying to think like why Bitcoin gets so much. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when a Tesla catches fire in the news, one out of a, a hundred million Teslas or whatever, it catches fire and it's all over the news. Whereas there's like 40,000 car fire deaths a year or something like that. Right. And you're like, why is that one so new? And I think it's because it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's new. It's controversial. Uh, just saying it in a headline gets a lot of, it's like Trump, but just saying it in a headline gets more clicks. Yeah. There's something about it that's captivated the people. It, it's a global market. It's disrupting the old guard and the, the powers that have been in the fiat currency system. And people either love it or they hate it. Um, some people are apathetic, but by now, I think most people know what it is and they're in one of those camps. Well, I think it's both sides. Both sides have a point. Like you could just be like, it's not backed up by anything. But then the other side can argue, well, well it's actually backed up by this and then it ends better than the old thing. But it, so, gets, it gets the conversation going like, well, what's the dollar backed by? What is gold really, right? It, it gets people asking the question, what is money? And for our whole lives, we just assume it's dollars and stocks. It's money. I think I actually had a, an advantage over other people. And I realized it later in life, it was going to India. It was going to India every few years with my parents. And we would all of a sudden, we'd cross this imaginary border and we would be 70 times richer, 70 times. Mm. My $1 was essentially 70 Indian dollars. That's what, that's what it was my whole life. And I remember thinking, it was like, well, why is that? What's going on there? Why, like, like some, it's not just a little exchange rate. There's some reason why they have less money and I have more money because of where I was born. And I started realizing early on, I'm just like, oh, it's just because of what 
it's backed up by, which is the Indian government versus the U.S. government. The Indian government, a lot of lot of sketchiness going on in the U.S. government, less sketchiness, especially for the time. What did you notice? There was like gold was a a real important piece of the savings pie for a lot of people in it. Oh, that, that's a, that's a big thing. Whenever there's like a wedding and stuff, they give a lot of gold, even you yeah. can't, because that's the way that like, if you lived in a village back in the day or, or currently that you kind of keep your money. Also the Indian uh, dollar is so funky. The yeah. Banks are weird. Like there's just a lot of corruption that's not well understood on this side of the world. Yeah. That happens over there that like people just don't trust those banks. And like, so they, like we're starting to just trust banks a little bit. They really don't trust banks. Right. Yeah. yeah so they, they store their wealth in gold. So, that, you know, I think, you know, people in India have a much better understanding, I think, of like why Bitcoin is valuable because of what it offers. Like here in the West, you know, people that have been, you know, using like Amex Platinum cards and credit card points and having access to high yield savings accounts, like they haven't really felt the the need for Bitcoin where like, you know, I've traveled to places like Myanmar and India and a lot of places in Africa and Southeast Asia where they have those same problems where they don't trust the banks. They don't trust the governments. They don't have access to a thriving stock market like we have in the U.S. And so they're trying to preserve their wealth either in gold or something tangible and Bitcoin emerges. And it's like, actually, this has a lot of benefits over gold. So it's that's why it's catching fire around the world. I mean, another thing I noticed a long time ago too, Indians were way, I mean, a lot of other countries, but like they were sending text message money way back in the day. I'm talking like the old ass Nokia, you know, those brick phones. Yeah. They were sending text messages money back in the day. And I was just like, why don't we have that? Yeah. And the reason is because we already have a robust banking system. Everyone lives near a bank. If you're a remote Indian farmer, uh, the text message thing is the best way to go. Yeah. They, they actually leapfrogged credit cards, right? Like credit yeah. cards were our big innovation. And we've been like hanging on to this very inefficient thing. Like the fact that, you know, merchants charge three or 4%, like that, that's so much bloat in the system. And, and like Bitcoin and just crypto in general is going to arbitrage a lot of that away, I think. Yeah. I, I saw so many of those examples of like why it was better. Um, whenever it, I have a question about this though. Yeah. Sometimes whenever I try to think of like crypto, I just try to think of like an asset, like I, learning about crypto made me learn more about the stock market. Basically the way you calculate Bitcoin price and tell me if I'm wrong, is you take the market cap of Bitcoin, let's say it's 1.3 trillion or whatever right now. You take that number, you divide it by the existing supply, let's say 19.5 million. Mm -hmm. That's the price. Yeah. That's what it, the price should be. Now it could be higher. It could be lower based on some exchange rates, but is that accurate? Well, so the way that price is discovered is through open markets, like, you know, when you think of Coinbase or Kraken or Binance, right? There's all these exchanges around the world. Um, we call them centralized exchanges because it's a company that creates like, it's just like Apple, like how you see the the price of Apple. There's buyers and there's, there's sellers. That's called making a market. And whatever the agreed upon price is today, what buyers and sellers are willing to trade at, that's where the price is. And then when you multiply the price per Bitcoin times the supply, that gives you that $1.3 trillion market cap. So, so price is very subjective. Some people say Bitcoin's worth zero. Some people say it should be worth a million. Today, it's trading around 65 to 70,000 per Bitcoin. And it's gone up. It's, it's appreciated in value at a rate of about 125% a year for the past like 12 years. Hmm. That's like when people say million dollar Bitcoin, I remember always thinking like, that sounds stupid, but then I just, I just did a calculation and you can do it on your phone. You say, okay, right now it's 1.3 trillion. And if this continues over the course of a decade or two, it would be worth a million dollars. If like, there's like eight more trillion more dollars that pour into it, something yeah. like that, whatever mm -hmm. the number was. Yeah. There, there's a lot of mental models that are out there right now trying to figure out where Bitcoin's price is going. You'll hear things like stock to flow ratio or people just comparing Bitcoin to gold. So gold right now is about 10 times the value of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin's around 1.3, 1.4, gold's around 14 trillion. So people say, well, you know, millennials and Gen Z and younger like Bitcoin more than gold. And what we've seen with the new spot ETFs is gold ETF values have been getting capital sucked out 
and that money has been going into Bitcoin. So some people are making a, a, a case like, well, what if Bitcoin 10 X is from here and becomes as valuable as all the gold in the world? So there, you, you know, you can come up with things like that, but there's a lot of variables. It, it's not a simple equation like that. Hmm. One, one thing, so I, I put in my little inflation protection kit, um, the stocks, basically FANG, and then also Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And when I went down the rabbit hole years ago, just learning about this, I was like, I think here's my theory and, and feel free to poke it. And my theory was worth nothing. I'm just some dude. I think Bitcoin's like MySpace. It was like the first one out there. It got the, it got the name brand, right? And no one thought it could be toppled. But Facebook came in and Facebook definitely wasn't as cool. Facebook was a little like less cool. Like you couldn't customize it. You can do all the cool stuff that like all those sparkly things that MySpace had, but it was just faster and it was a little bit more useful and a little easier to use. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just like swept in and then boop, it just flipped one day and then it took off. I almost feel like in the next decade, we see Ethereum do that. So I don't think that's a ridiculous statement. Like yeah. I, I see where you're going with that. And I, I think that's reasonable to, to say. Um, I put gold, I, I put Bitcoin in a class of its own because of the, uh, what we call tokenomics, the, the supply and demand, the code, the way that it is, it's very different from Ethereum, Solana, all the other crypto assets, you know, we, we don't even really call them cryptocurrencies anymore because a lot of these things, Ethereum included, aren't really cryptocurrencies. They're networks, they're layer two solutions, they're all these things that, yeah, they could have a token associated with it and operate like a currency, but I think people need to start using the proper term, which is crypto asset. Mm -hmm. Cri Bitcoin is a crypto asset that operates as a currency and it is in a class of its own to me. And then you have all these other competitors like Ethereum. I put those in like kind of the same risk level as like startups, right? Like most startups fail. I think 95% or more of all the other cryptocurrencies are going to go to zero over time. Maybe it's Ethereum. I, I hold some Ethereum long-term as well. I also trade it short-term. Um, I don't try to guess which ones are going to be successful over time. I just look at the ones that I think have a good shot and I, I trade them. I buy and sell to accumulate more dollars and more Bitcoin that I can diversify in other assets and grow my position sizes. I mean, we've both lived through a couple of bubbles and like the crypto stuff of like people just being like, this is going to go up. You're like, well, that's a bubble. Mm -hmm. Just saying something's going to go up with zero proof behind it. So most of the like the the, the altcoins, the shit coins, you, you have all these like random ones that are just branched off of something else. It does sound like most of those will go to zero, yeah. but it's like, okay, Bitcoin has the momentum. I see that. Like uh, that one, I think like it's probably in the clear for a long time, right? I doubt mm -hmm. that will just go away. And then the other one, I just see people build off of Ethereum. So you look at GitHub, how many forks are there of these different uh, things? Mm -hmm. And so the, the development is mostly on Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so these two competing ones, and I like I like competition in this. Absolutely. And the cool thing is that instead, instead of like proof of work, Ethereum uses like less energy, not so much for the environment thing. It's just, you could run it on your phone eventually, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. And then also you can do stuff on top of it. So it's like, which one is actually inherently useful? And I, I think like Bitcoin has not got there. I think it will be the first one to be like a, you know, 5 trillion, 10 trillion. It'll probably always win that. Mm -hmm. But I do think Ethereum is very useful and a lot of the world will eventually be built on top of it. A lot of the companies I'm seeing that are interesting in that Web3 world are based on Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I agree. That's with my the, theory there, yeah. Right, and everybody is asking, well, what's the what's the killer use case for Bitcoin? Like, what's it going to evolve to? It's like, it's there. The killer use case for Bitcoin is Bitcoin. It's a store of value. It, it doesn't have to have the lowest transaction fees or have the best, you know, computational, like blah, 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 blah. It's like, it is what it is. And it, it doesn't have to be an either or. It can be an and, Ethereum is also going out and kicking ass in all these different ways. So yeah, it's cool. And and I agree with you. I think competition is good. And if something else comes along that ultimately is better than Bitcoin, awesome. Let's 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 I mean, let her rip. There's like 120 fiat currencies out there. Why wouldn't there be 120 cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. or or systems? I think I think that will be the case. Yeah. But the but the big ones, like if you look at currencies in the United in the world, it's like United States number one followed by a couple like there's like the big five i'd say yeah and, and, and i think and with look, cryptos it'll be the same. no fiat currency 
stands the test of time. Like they, on average, they have, you know, a few decades of supremacy and then they get overinflated or they implode for some reason. And it's proven that fiat currency fiat currencies are a terrible store of wealth because of inflation, right? Um, we have a couple buddies here in Austin, you know, one guy that nets eight figures a year and basically has cash and then his business value. And like, you realize for every million dollars that you hold in cash, you're losing about 30 to 50,000 a year in, to inflation. And so that I think is the the important point that you know we've been talking about of like well why even invest it's so your wealth grows quicker than that inflation. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I think that you know how, how do you define financial freedom? The the way I think about it is if you have a portfolio that supports your your dream lifestyle and grows faster than that costs. So if if you're portfolio is appreciating at, you know, 10% a year and your dream lifestyle costs 3%, you don't have to add capital. You don't have to work. You continue to get richer over time while that portfolio pays for that lifestyle. To me, that's true financial freedom, mm -hmm. but most people never get to a point where they even have a little bit of financial freedom. They're just always working and spending and not building something that appreciates greater than inflation. And so they're just constantly struggling. Huh. I mean, this is, this is the thing I've thought about more as it's like, think about like, Hmm, what am I going to do in the future and with family and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And like the way to like not work and truly make passive income is not like little side businesses. It's actually the financial stuff. And then also I, I just see like the U S debt and stuff kind of just like spiraling out of control. And you're like, well, how do we, how do we get that under control? Like, is, is any of our presidents going to do this in the near future? It doesn't really look like that when I look at a chart and for years it just keeps going up and you're like, yeah, this is, I guess what's what, like, going to be the politician to actually be fiscally responsible. They're not going to get voted. I in. mean, was it like, I think like the Bill Clinton era was the last time we had no national debt or something like well, that. Well, we had a surplus. Yeah, we were, we, a surplus. we were going the right direction. And then it was like, Oh, screw that. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> reverse and so, hardcore. And so, so like, look, I, I I'm bullish United States, but at the same time, it's going to take a big effort to like get back down there. Yeah. And so like in the future, you're just like, okay, if this, if this chart does keep going at a reasonable pace, you're like, we're, we're a little bit fucked, right? Like, like this doesn't, this doesn't become sustainable in the long run. Yeah. I, I hope there's somebody smart in the U S government that's accumulating Bitcoin for the U S government, because I have a strong suspicion that there are a handful of governments out there doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's only going to take one or two medium-sized economies to say, we've been stacking Bitcoin as a way to be fiscally responsible um, for there to be like a FOMO rush mm -hmm. from other governments. And that to me is like the extreme bull case. Like if Bitcoin does go to like a million a coin, like how does that happen? What, is, what does the world look like? That's how it happens is governments say, well, you know, we know that we can't just spend our way out of problems and fiat currencies aren't the best solution. So, oh, by the way, the past year we've been stacking a few billion here or there and then other governments start doing that. That's where that you know, kind of pie in the sky idea. Comes I mean, isn't, isn't that what hold most of the value of gold governments? Mm -hmm. they, they, they literally have like Fort Knox or whatever they're the Chinese. Allegedly, equivalent. Yeah. allegedly we can't audit that. You can audit Bitcoin holdings though. That that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah. I, I'd argue it's like a better, like I've never seen, I don't know where the gold is. Yeah. And like, how do you transfer it? How do you get, who has access to it? Is someone skimming a little off the top, like physically, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you just don't know. Yeah. We can't audit Fort Knox. That That is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. All right. So, so you have a, so we have something in common. You have a community, you have a yeah. community. Is it like a forum? Is that, um, it's a combination of like a members area, um, that you log into with videos and classes. We typically use zoom for classes and we have a discord, um, server with probably 30 or 40 different chat channels. So it's like Slack, free, yeah. free Slack, free Slack invented for gamers, but it's kind of better than Slack in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I love discourse. It's pretty awesome. Um, how do, so, so on that note, like, how do you advertise it? Like, how do you advertise something like this community? So, um, it's mostly organic. Um, we, we run some ads to the newsletter, but, uh, there's three of us that run the community. It's me, Nikki and Travis, who, um, Travis DeVitt was a former hedge fund guy that helped grow one of the best performing hedge funds of the past decade. He retired 
went to help our buddy start a, a startup, grew that to a couple hundred million. And then I convinced him to come into our community and he runs the stock side of things. Mm -hmm. And then Nikki has a CFP. She helps people basically make sure they have a, a complete like financial plan. Because if you make a bunch of money in the markets and you don't optimize taxes, you're, you're wasting money. And then I'm on the crypto and like the angel investing, like startup mm -hmm. side. And, and then uh, you mentioned before that it's, it's cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. Like like whenever like Bitcoin's way up, everyone joins. Yeah. And then whenever Bitcoin's down, no one's joining, but you're just like, this should be the time you should join. Yeah. What What's actually interesting, the other day I ran the numbers and our average membership is over five years. What? We have a lot of people that have been there like seven, eight, nine years or average. And this is active members. Like there's going to be people that like come in, they pay one month and then they quit or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the active members that we have, the average time is over five years. So we, we do a pretty bad job at recruiting newbies. Yeah. We just have a, a, like a core group of guys and ladies that have been with us for a long time. We, we have a, you know, a podcast. Um, the three of us each individually have our own YouTube channel. We have the newsletter that we started. So, you know, it's mostly organic people that are coming in and finding us through content. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're not good at being hypey and, and, and driving a shit ton of new people. That's that, that has been the problem is like during bull markets, we'll get the new people, but trying to convince them to stay when prices are down, that's the hard part. Cause it's like that when you plant seeds in bear markets, that's where you really build wealth. Because if you just come in at the top of the market, you, that's harvest season. So you're a hundred percent social media, basically. Mm -hmm. Huh? Interesting. Have you all ever done like SEO or anything like that? Has it ever worked out? Not really. I, I, I think, you know, most people nowadays in the finance space are looking on YouTube or yeah, I guess mostly YouTube. Um, I don't really do TikTok. Do you, do you do TikTok? Uh, we have an agency that posts my short clips and TikTok is one of the platforms, but yeah. it's not like a high performing platform for me as far as I know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think they blocked a lot of crypto content anyway. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah. I'd say YouTube is probably our best lead magnet. Like I did, um, it was actually over 10 years ago, 2013, I did a Bitcoin basics video playlist mm -hmm. that got like, th that was just teaching people about the, the mm -hmm. basics of Bitcoin. Um, that got a few million views and that that's probably been our number one lead magnet. Just that one playlist. Just make a long like, like how to use Bitcoin for like beginners. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. It was like Bitcoin oh, basics for, for beginners. This wasn't when it was like brand new and like nobody knew what was going on. And so because of that, that's how a lot of people came into the ecosystem. And then they found all our other stuff through that. Oh, interesting. Um, and then what about like, here's one thing I've always wished I was, I started Neville's financial blog. That was my first popular thing on the internet. Yeah, I, ever man, did. I remember that. And, I, and then I eventually moved it. Cause I was like, I don't only talk about financial stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but over time, I'm like, being in the finance world is good in a way. And I'm sure it has pros and cons, but it's good because you're close to the money. You're talking about money. Therefore, like if I would, had a video channel at that time, if YouTube was around, I would make in crazy ad money mm -hmm. versus like copywriting, which you make like, okay. Cause it's like marketing stuff. But if you're talking about investing, like the companies that will take over your channel for ads are way better or they pay a lot more. Yeah. Um, any pros of cons of being in like that money space? that you see? Yeah. I mean, the, the con of like being in crypto in general is like the impersonators and the scammers and the hackers and mm -hmm. all the crap that comes along with that. I mean, there's probably 10 fake Chris Dunn's having conversations with people right now trying to get them <laughs> to send crypto for me to manage, which by the way, I, I don't do. If anybody ever contacts you saying, Hey, send me your money. I'll double it. It's probably a scam. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, that's the con. What about the 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 pro the pro is that like your value prop is really good yeah for you to say like join my wealth building community or whatever and it's just like we'll teach you how to get richer yeah like how to, how to make a plan or we just discuss what we are trading and you could copy them if you want that's a good value prop yeah i mean it's when you're when you're talking about building wealth there's a very tangible roi there where like if i if i was going to teach like wellness or yoga I wouldn't really know how to convey that value as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't make any like representations like, hey, we're going to help you double your wealth. Like there's a there's a lot of variables there, but we have enough clout and we have enough people that have built life changing wealth that they know, OK, we're the real deal. So we don't have a, a problem retaining people. Um, 
So I, yeah, I think, you know, the benefit of being in finance is selfishly and personally, I just love it. Like I'm doing what I love. Mm -hmm. And then it's the, the tangible ROI makes it a no brainer. You know, we charge 200 bucks a month for the community. People have no problem paying that if they're serious about building wealth, that's a price point that's high enough where it, you know, it filters out people that are, you know, just looking for like get rich quick shit. Mm -hmm. But also you, you think in my head, like, okay, if I make a hundred grand off this advice, 200 bucks a month is zero. Yeah. It's nothing. I mean, to, to have a community where you have access to a CFP, a former hedge fund badass, and somebody like me, who's been trading for two decades, full time, thousands and thousands of hours. Like it's, it's kind of a no brainer for somebody that wants to, to pursue that. If you're like, I just want to buy the S and P and not think about it. This is probably overkill, but I had this, uh, <laughs> I had this, uh, some roommates in college and they would watch baseball all the time. And this is like in college areas a, a while ago. And what I did, I made a website for them because they wanted to make a website. I helped them. It's called parlays and I have no idea what happened to it, but we bought Yahoo ads to it. And basically the whole gist of this was it was every week we send you our picks for who's going to win baseball games. Like, we're not saying like these will win. We're just saying like, mm -hmm. these are three idiots that watch this. And I was like, there's no way this works. Day one, they were making sales. Every single day they made sales. And I was I was so shocked because I was starting all these businesses. I was like, I've never seen it this easy. And I was like, maybe I'm in the wrong industry. <laughs> because just because I think what happens in people's head, they're like, I'm gonna bet on a game and make ten thousand right. dollars. And to pay forty nine bucks to hear what these guys think could probably give me an edge. So I think like what people think in their head is an advantage, like what the value prop is. And I think that's why I like the money investing world. I think like Ramit Sethi, yeah. I think he targeted it really well of like there's a lot of people out there that aren't going to invest a lot. Let me help them get raises in their jobs. Mm. And that was his like flagship dream one dream, dream job course or whatever. Yeah. And I remember thinking like, I was like, man, he fucking nailed that positioning on that one. Yeah. Like you spend five grand or whatever for this course, but you could potentially make 40 grand more. And this isn't like speculation. This is like, you probably will make this money more. Yeah. And that's a really big market, right? A lot of people have jobs and a lot of people want to learn how to make more in their job and not have to start a business. So yeah, or just yeah. learn a little bit of negotiating or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So positioning like that was cool. And like being in that finance area is always helpful, I think. Definitely. And dude, going back to the gambling thing, like so many people have this incessant desire to gamble. Like think about Vegas, lottery tickets, you know, sports betting. Like we've seen that like sports betting stuff explode. And, you know, like, okay, so- like I said, Bitcoin, I think, is in a, a world of its own. And then all these like shit coins and meme coins and like all this stuff, it's mostly just degenerate gamblers that are yeah. in these <laughs> markets. And at, so we had two, so far, two major like altcoin bubbles. Uh, from 2017, we had all these ICOs, these initial coin offerings, which were basically like fake startups. Like people wrote a white paper, put up a website, raised tens of millions of dollars, and then nothing ever came of it. The SEC sued the shit out of a lot of people. And I was like, all right, that's it. Crypto's done. Then 2021 comes around, NFTs, you know, all the JPEGs were selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was like, oh my God, this is back. And then like we we made money because we traded it on the way up. Mm -hmm. um, but when that imploded in 2022, I'm like, all right, that's it. That's done. And then here we are in 2024 and I see the meme coins and all this shit popping off again. I just wrote on Twitter. I'm like, all right, I'm throwing in the towel, crypto is here to stay forever, not Bitcoin, but crypto specifically, meme coins, shit coins, because of people's just desire to gamble. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, this is more accessible than gambling. It's more fun than like lottery. Um, and people feel like they have more of an edge over like sports betting. So yeah, dude, I, I think crypto is here to stay forever. That, that is very interesting. Also, if you want to trade at 3 a.m. at night, this, the, the the New York Stock Exchange is closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but crypto's like, come on in, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's always there for you. And, and it's fun. I mean, it, it really is. And so I think, you know, if people do it with an amount of money that they can afford to lose, sure, cool. Because if ICO rug pulls and SEC lawsuits aren't going to dissuade people, I don't think anything is. And it's a worldwide too. It's, not yeah. just, it's not just United States, not just Mexico. It's the entire world. Exactly. Uh, interesting. Uh, so 
random topic, newsletters. I know you started daily newsletter, like D- daily dough. Daily right? co. Yeah. yeah. I followed Sam into the the whole newsletter space like 10 years too late. So, so, <laughs> so what do you, what do you think? Uh, getting in at peak newsletter bubble. I don't yeah. think we're there yet, but uh, <laughs> what, what do you, what do you think? How's that experience? So okay. Far? So, so I, I think I approached it a little bit differently. Like one, we already had a list of like over a hundred thousand folks mm-hmm. and a lot of them were disengaged. So we, we were just hammering them like, Hey, we got this new newsletter. Really, it was just a way for us to be more disciplined about emailing our list. Mm -hmm. Like, um, there have been several years where I'm like, really good. It's like every week we have a promo or we have something we're talking about and we're, we're emailing the list and staying engaged and trying to raise revenue. And other years, I'm like lazy with it. And I'm like, all right, if we do a newsletter, that gives us an excuse just to be consistent and also to deliver a lot of value. So every it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and every newsletter, but all three of us, me, Nikki, and Travis, each write like a 250 to 350 word brief. So there's usually like a topic for everybody in there. And yeah, we've gotten great feedback on it. it it's not growing super fast. Mm-hmm. Like w- we've tested some ads and we're still testing ads, but it to us, it's just a way to stay in front of our existing list and also grow a little over time. Um, hopefully it takes off and grows into something big, but even if it doesn't turn into, you know, something like, you know, trends or the hustle or something like that, where it's a business in and of itself, it's still a very lucrative way to drive revenue to our products and our events and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, newsletters and podcasts share something in common. There's no inherent viral loop. Mm-hmm. Like if we, if we put this video on YouTube and it gets a billion views in one second, YouTube will be like, let's show it to a bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen with podcasts currently, maybe in the future it will. And it definitely doesn't happen with newsletters. You got to grow organically, like by being on other newsletters or being on other podcasts or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen the same thing with our podcast. We talk money. It's like we get maybe a few thousand views per episode on YouTube and then a few thousand downloads on audio. But I'm okay with that because I know that core group of people, they are very high value people. Mm-hmm. Like the the people that will listen to an hour about us talking about investing trends or, you know, investing wisdom or topics or what the markets are doing. Like the the value per listener is probably, you know, several hundred bucks a year, I would say. Yeah. Also, when people see something like the, like, I, th- I swear Sam started the newsletter trend. Yeah. Once everyone saw he sold, they're just like, I'll just start a newsletter because you, there's no coding involved. It's super easy. Anyone could write some crap, right? Yeah. Use chat GPT to write some whatever. I think the problem is back in the day when the hustle grew really fast, also AppSumo, uh, sim- similar time frame arc. And I was like behind the scenes on both Facebook ads were cheap and mm-hmm. tracking was different. So now that uh, Apple introduced kind of like, you can't really track a lot of stuff. You can't really advertise as specifically as you could before. And I remember in the beginning of AppSumo, it would cost like 25 cents to acquire a customer. Yeah, Now it's like eight to $16. Yeah. So you're just like, okay, these are slightly different economies that we're working with over here. So to get to several million subscribers really, really fast by paid advertising is very hard now. Yeah. Or or, correction, very expensive, like really expensive. Right. Right. Yeah. I I agree with that. I mean, we found that to be true. It's like, man, like we're, it's costing us like minimum five or six bucks to get a daily dose subscriber. And I'm like, is that worth it? Uh, It is, but it's just a, it's a pain in the ass. Cause yeah, it's definitely not quarter cent leads anymore. Yeah. I mean, I pay at least, I paid between six and 8,000 a year just to, just to host my email list. What Through where? ConvertKit. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that alone, that's an, that's an expense. Yep. Um, the other thing is you lose people every time you send an e- email newsletter. There are a certain amount of people, like if you have tens of thousands of people or a hundred thousand people, you're going to lose 50 to 300 people just because you send something. Mm-hmm. Like for example, I'll get like, you know, Chubby's shorts emails because I bought from there once and I unsubscribe not because they hate their newsletter. It's just like, I, I'm, I, I can't deal with this right now, Mm -hmm. right? I I just, I just can't have this extra thing in my newsletter. So a lot of people just unsubscribe. So it is very hard to uh, grow an email newsletter without paid promotion or some other viral aspect. Have you found that like your podcast feeds, your email list or vice versa, or do you track any of that? I do. Yeah. Email, email stays about stagnant unless you really push, Mm -hmm. unless you really push. What really helped it was SEO. And I think SEO, I I, I almost want to nail the coffin shut on SEO because it's not dead, but for the most people, it's kind of dead. 
Um, I'd say shifting your efforts to more like social media, putting out content organic, much like you're doing, yeah. is probably a better use of time than SEO. Because SEO, every time like you get up there, something happens to where it shoves you out. Oh, and then yeah. you have to work really hard to get back up there. It's a constant fight. It shoves you out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, and it's just like when someone's just reading a random article versus watching a 30 minute video of you, that's a whole different thing. That's an yeah. entirely different thing. So the YouTube subscribers are way better than like someone who just randomly lands on an SEO term. I think so too. Yeah, for us, it's it's the person that is searching a specific term. So like for Travis, he does a lot of stock analysis. It's like if he does a PayPal or a Tesla video, people are actively seeking that information mm -hmm. and then they find him and they trust him. They're like, oh my God, this guy's different than all the other stock YouTubers out there. Like he actually knows his shit and that builds trust. And then they come in the funnel. I found that like keyword search specific type of person, get them into the ecosystem. And then a percentage of those people just never leave. Yeah. It's called a branded search, by the way, if they type in Tesla, Travis DeWitt, they're looking up what Travis said. Right. They don't care what anyone else said. That's the best. Yeah. So I, th I think uh, if you have those branded searches, actually, whenever I change the name of copywriting course from copywriting course with K's to C's, one major downside that I noticed was it was so easy to type in copy or copywriting, but you just type a K O P Y in anything, copy email, and it would always show my stuff. That now, was if you type in you. copywriting with the C and then like email, like there's probably other searches that come up, other videos. I might not even be on there. Do you still dominate a lot of the keywords for copywriting on YouTube or? No. It, it, oh, on YouTube? Yeah. No, there's a lot more, there's a lot more competition. But if you type in copywriting with a K, I almost entirely, I, I own that word. Yeah. And so I, do you regret going to CC or do I think so. Actually, you know, it's, it's funny over a Twitter conversation. I posted something about domains two days ago and someone was like, I missed the copywriting domain. And from that, I was just like, let me look it up. And I typed in copywriting.com and I purchased it 1500 bucks. <laughs> you own copywriting.com? As of two days ago, I bought copywriting.com with K, with K, sorry. Oh, with K. With K. I was going to say copywriting no, no, no. was only 1500 Because eventually, so I actually learned this, I learned this lesson. We're totally way off topic here, but I learned this lesson twice. When I had houseofrave.com, you remember my first real <laughs> yeah. business called House of Rave. It was a rave company. And what I noticed was most of the customers were 35 year old moms buying for birthday parties. And so I started a couple spinoff sites. One was called, the most successful one was called bodymonkey.com. I don't, I don't know why it was a huh. random. It just, I didn't even know how I came up with that name, but it was basically like a more sanitized store where it sold party supplies. But the thing is I can never get the same kind of like emotional connection or kind of like fun vibe that house of rave provided. It just, it just never really worked out. And so selling disco balls on uh, body monkey was always hard, but house of rave was cooler. It had like this rave edgy kind of connotate. It like kind of stood for something. Yeah. And even though it seemed less professional, it always did better. And I remember with this, I was like, we're going to this because it sounds more professional. And you know what? I don't think, I don't think that that works. I don't think that works. I think people like the funkiness. Yeah. And, and, and we actually did a thing called the copywriting course, like business fundamentals course or something. And I wore a suit and recorded it. It flopped like crazy. Really? I don't, one, like, I'm just not like a suit guy. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not like the, the buttoned up corporate guy necessarily um, that people want. I, I, I'm me. I, I'm more, I'm more the K's than, than the C's. And so I remember it flopped and it was, just, it kind of was a, an interesting lesson of like, uh, I don't think people care about the name quite as much, but they do like that it has some edge or some fun. Right. Into and, it. It's like more memorable. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you definitely have a a like a fun personality and, and that you. stands out. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but uh but the other thing is the branded search. I remember thinking, like, man, I don't own the word copywriting, but I own the word copywriting with the K. Right. I also had a really good tell me what you think, and this always hits, I think. Whenever people think about copywriting, they think about text, right? It's like writing on a page. It's like you change a letter from here to there, like that. With copywriting, I'm like, I am agnostic of what medium you use. Video images, text, VR, whatever. That's what copywriting is. Getting information from one brain to another, not just like through text because mm -hmm. it could be better than text. And so that's why I always like the copywriting angle, even though the reality was I just, I couldn't buy the domain name at the time. <laughs> I couldn't get it. Yeah. But that always gave me this, uh, this better kind of uh, tagline for the company that like, we are just trying to get information in other people's heads. We don't care which way we do it. So is that kind of the the focus now is just like, not just I'm going to train you how to type, but I'm going to train you how to what, just deliver better messages. It always and, was that. Okay. It was that from the very beginning. I've, I've, I've long from day one of like copywriting course. And, and even long before that, before it was a thing, I was like, 
anyone who's a writer should learn how to make images. And now I think they should learn how to make videos as well. If you're trying to communicate an idea, you're missing out on these gigantic mediums because you just don't know how to make videos. And like, you don't have to be a professional designer to make images that no, you st- have a stand account. out. Yeah. Yeah. I you, mean, you, some of you your used stick to figure be. things were like amazing. Yeah. And, and it's kind of funny, like back, those still work really well. And people are like, that's Neville. Yep. Yeah. I used to put like, like watermarks and stuff all over it. I'm like, I think I'm good now. People but, know. Yeah. That, that's or like you see like wait but why is another great example like one great writing but then two like these great stick figure images and you're like that's wait but why mm-hmm. like you know instantaneously what it is and sometimes those stick figures transfer stuff better than uh they transfer information better than a picture would yeah 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 so that that's a random side thing here's another random side thing i'm about to get married soon how congratulations you, thank you how do you and your wife split finances how do people do that um what do you mean by split finances is it is it like together like yeah do you have like one like sometimes people say like yeah we have an account i'm like do you have like one account that it all goes into or what well i guess we're kind of unique because one we work together two we're both like finance nerds and investing nerds Mm -hmm. so like i guess the way that we approach it is a little differently like she manages our stock portfolio i manage the crypto portfolio together we make like big financial decisions together and we've been Mm -hmm. married for a long time so like everything's mismatched Uh um and we're like on the same goal like we have big financial goals together so um it's funny i used to be uh whenever i was broke i spent money to make myself feel better so i was a little more reckless Mm -hmm. and it's like the more money we have the more conservative i get i'm kind of like i find myself like being cheap in weird ways now where she's she used to be super conservative and now she's like we don't have to think about you know mm-hmm. a, a hundred dollar dinner versus a five hundred dollar dinner you know like things like that and um so it's funny how behavior kind of changes mm-hmm. but yeah for us i mean we're we're on the same journey together and we're we're actively managing a portfolio so i guess it's just a, a little different it's a little bit different yeah yeah but is everyone like like if you get a paycheck and she gets a paycheck, does it just go in the same bucket? Yeah. Is that what happens? Yeah. Well, we have multiple businesses. And so like she's starting an investment advisory firm. So that's going to be its own entity and bank account and things like that. And then at the end of the year or, you know, whenever we do our contributions to pensions or retirement funds, you know, we'll decide what accounts those come from. But yeah, cool. for the most part, it's all together. And then, okay, cool. We'll wrap this up over here. But like, uh, let's see, one minute crypto advice. Someone who's not very into investing, like what do they do? Well, you got to decide what your goals are. Like, what, you know, do you want to just buy something and hold it? Are you trying to really build meaningful wealth? Like start there and then decide how much time you're willing to put into it. And if you truly love investing and, and you love paying attention to markets, I'd say, be active. If not, just dollar cost average Bitcoin and forget about the rest of the shit. So buy Bitcoin every month and don't change that. Yeah. I actually built a strategy where you can like backtest different types of DCA strategies. So there's a website, TradingView. Have you heard of it? I think so. TradingView.com. It's like a charting platform. And I built a software program where you can go in and you can say, all right, show me the results of what it would look like if I bought $500 a week worth of Bitcoin or, you know, $100 a month or whatever. And then you can change parameters where you say, well, I don't want to buy during bull markets. I only want to buy when prices are down. So what if I did that when price was only, you know, 50% or more off of all time highs, right? So, you know, that's something that we do in the community is talk about different strategies. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, at the end of the day, just decide, like, do you have risk capital that you could lose, you know, and not change your quality of life? If so, how active do you want to be with that? Yeah. Interesting. What about, um, would you start a newsletter again? <laughs> um, from scratch? I, I don't know. Like, probably not. I'd, I'd probably go YouTube over newsletter. We just did newsletter because we had the email list anyway, and we needed a better way to just communicate with those people. Uh-huh. Um, I think I'd go YouTube channel over newsletter. Would you? What do you think about this? A newsletter is just a blog. Yeah. Right? Like it it all comes back full circle to the year 2000 or whatever, when the internet started getting popular, Mm -hmm. there was blogs that you just went to. And like, what is a newsletter, but a couple of blog posts stuck together. Right. And so actually what we do is like 
My uh, my individual pieces of my newsletter, there's five or six pieces in each newsletter. Those get posted on my personal blog, nevblog.com. They also get, some of them get posted on swipefile.com or actually they originate on swipefile.com because I find something cool, post it there mm -hmm. and then raid swipefile.com for newsletter content. So, so you have your individual blogs and then the newsletter piece of it is just an aggregation yeah. of that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, and you can like create, you can put that into different mediums too, right? You could probably do like yeah. a YouTube video where you're talking about that topic. And and, th and then actually a lot of our YouTube videos that we do, uh, a lot of our interviews and stuff, but sometimes something really hits and I go, oh, that'd be a cool lesson for inside the video or a YouTube thing. Actually, most of my videos are probably inside of our community. Mm. Most of the content I make is private. Um, I don't think it's like YouTubeized where it's just like, hey guys, how's it going? It's, it's not like as well edited because it's just like, I'm going to show you how to write a really good email. It might be like a slightly more boring uh, thing, but for the people inside, it's interesting. Have Have you posted those videos on YouTube? They, the tend, to, they tend to like top out at like one to three K views and just kind of languish mm -hmm. because they're, they're not, they're not, they're not good compared to the other things on the algorithm, right? Yeah. I'm competing against an algorithm over there. So if I want to make it good, I have to say like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Like you have to really drum it up. So there's a style of YouTube video that can take off and make it worthwhile. But for, if I'm just like, here's something I, I learned about how I use GPTs or something like that. And it's kind of time sensitive. I'll record a video, very minimal uh, editing and put it out into our community. Right. Just as a value add. But that as like a, but that as a YouTube video and then making a whole email about it is, is not good enough. Mm -hmm. It used to be, I think back in the day, but now you're competing against, uh, a whole plethora of like yeah, audience. You've got to dial eyeballs. in that first, what, eight to 10 seconds of watch time. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and that, I don't want to get caught up in that because we've seen enough of this where like, there's always little hacks on every platform that work. Like it used to be like, just write a really long thread and it automatically it's posted on Twitter. It's like, well, it doesn't really work anymore. Mm -hmm. It can, but it's not like the hack that it once was. And so I don't want to like spend all this time editing together a video like that just to play the algorithm. Then like the algorithm changes. Yeah. Do you enjoy what you're doing right now? Like the, yeah, I think it's easy. Like it, it feels like I would do it for free. That's that's amazing. So yeah. like, what is your favorite part of your day? What does your day even look like? Like what's an average day for Neville? Like when you're like in your community, what are you doing? It, so in the community, we have writers that mainly answer a lot of stuff. Then I jump in there. Uh -huh. And so probably like 30 minutes or an hour a day. And there's some days where I do nothing <laughs> totally, but usually I jump in the community and do that. Everything. I'm very good at automating things. So the community is quite automated. So for example, if I need to respond to comments and it takes forever to like upload someone's comment and then respond to it, I built a software thing that I could just respond to a bunch at a time and it batch uploads, oh. you know, things like, things like that. I've been pretty good at automating. So in terms of maintenance for the community, other than my actual involvement is low. Um, creating content is probably what I do most of the day. Okay. And then just like back end maintenance stuff. But there are days when like, I don't, work much at all. I would like to spend more of my time creating videos. Okay. So you enjoy the content creation process. Yeah. And what about like startup investing or are you doing any more of that? I think it's one of those things where like, I think about it a lot, but I think it's like the Naval Ravikant way. Like you spend a whole year thinking about something and you make one move mm -hmm. and that's, that's the thing. Yeah. One to, or a few moves. I'm not like an active kind of trader person. And so I like paying attention to things like Bitcoin, I like paying attention to things, Ethereum, like decades long bets right? I pay attention to those things. And then whenever I see an opportunity, I might buy more or some of the things I dos call dollar cost average over time. Okay. Yeah. Just nice. like automatically in my brokerage account. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do something similar where I have like different capital buckets where it's like over here, this is my, you know, I buy Bitcoin, I put it on a hardware wallet and I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Then I have this capital bucket, my like multi-year position trades where I buy during a bear market, sell during euphoria. And then I have a different capital bucket for like swing trades where I buy and I sell within a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And so, you know, anybody listening to this, may, maybe you choose one or or multiple of those strategies. And it sounds like you've kind of dialed in a good balance where it's like you spend most of your effort creating content, working, you have a portfolio, you don't overthink it. And do you, do you ever listen to like startup pitches or like, are you actively looking for like startup investments? I, I've made angel investments. Yeah. yeah. Over the years. Um, and I think it follows that power law curve. Like some just kind of like flat line for a long period of time. Maybe mm -hmm. something happens, maybe it just gets washed out. I haven't had any get totally washed out yet, but, um, and then a couple will return big. And so I think, I think more so than the money I've received from those, what I've learned from them is more important. Yes. Yeah. 
So like, so for example, I invested in the hustle that sold. I did make money, but I think what's even more important was I got to be one of the people in the green room when all the cool people there, you know, the founder of WeWork, Miguel, or one of the co is just like sitting, chilling. You can go talk to him because I get to be at that thing. I find that kind of stuff a little bit more valuable than actual money returned. I'm glad you said that. I, I agree. Like um, I've been a part of a couple of angel investing networks here in Austin, and I've had a couple of exits, nothing insane, but the the most valuable thing was being around founders and other investors who have been investing for you know decades in startups and I would encourage people to do that too. It's like, if you are passionate about entrepreneurship or investing or just get around those people, get into those networks. Well, also they send investor updates and sometimes some companies send really good investor updates. Like, here's what we did. Here's the Facebook ads we tried. And like, for me, I'm like getting private access to those type of things. So it's almost like I'm joining a club. So I'm like, okay, if I write a 10,000 or 15,000 or $25,000 check to this person, 25,000 is the most I've given at any one given time. Um, If I give that money to them, Will I get back an education, like like private education behind the scenes? Yeah, you know. And so, for example, with the hustle or some or like App Sumo, it's kind of like, oh, these these giveaways worked really well, and here's what we learned. And I'm just like, oh wow, this is I get to hear this. This is kind of cool. And you can implement that in your you business. Can implement that in your business and, and make more sales, right? Yeah. So for me, I think that's actually kind of the coolest part of it. Now, look, if something has a big exit and I take the money, I'd be very happy with that too. Mm-hmm. But also that that learning aspect is where it really comes in. And the times I've done angel investment is kind of like a money grab where I'm like, I don't really care about the company, but I think someone told me this could be big. I feel like it's like not like worked out quite as well. Right. Where yeah. I was like, like I wanted to like hear from the founder, like, what are they doing? Like this guy's a good operator. I want to hear the inside story of it. Well said. Or be involved in it. I think like some like copy AI I invested in because like mm-hmm. they were the they they were like taken off during that era. And I wanted to be involved with them because I liked what they were doing. Right. And so I was just like, I want to be part of this. I don't know how to be a part of this otherwise. And so I will follow along someone who is doing something like that. Yeah. Startup investing can be such a time suck that I think it does make sense to lean into stuff that you actually care about or like invest in people you actually want to be around. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if it like VCs and stuff, like they have, they have a hard job. They have to find a lot of companies and they have to have really, really, really big exits for them to make any money. It's actually quite hard. It's easy for like the big ones, like A16Z or someone that has a name, but there's like thousands of other companies that like have to fight to be in rounds and stuff like that. I think that's a, it's a very difficult job to do. Yeah. I, I I've known angel investors that have been doing it for decades and have made dozens of investments and have zero exits. Oh, really? So, yeah. So I, I think if anybody's going to venture into it, you better love entrepreneurship. You better love just the the hustle and like try, trying to add value also to to startup founders. At I, the I had Dan Mar- Martell, the SaaS investor guy, and uh, he said, Naval Ravikant, this is his third hand advice, but I think this is uh, in line with what he says. He says, if you're going to do the minimum angel investing, make 12 bets. So give the same size check and do it over the course of four years. Mm -hmm. And 12 bets is least enough to where the power curve comes in. Like two of them hit, two of them just go totally bust. And the rest are kind of like return their money or go out of business, whatever. So the power law has enough effect to kick four years because you don't want to buy at a bull or bear time only. You want to, you want to average out. And then the other thing was write the same size check because there's no like real rhyme or reason, like which one does better. It's not like someone's like so good at like determining. It's almost just kind of like, it seems in the long run, kind of fucking random. Yeah. Like, of course it's like really good operators and stuff like that, but also it's like, there are some good operators that have had failures. Yeah. I think Tim Ferriss had a similar approach where what did he do? Like a quarter of a million and then did like 10 checks of 25 K or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's smart. Trying to position size them differently is yeah. I mean, the, it's so early and it's, it, it, there's so many variables. You don't know which ones are going to hit. Um, but yeah, my exits, both of them took over five years. So yeah, it's definitely not a short-term game either. Yeah. It's, it's not what you want to do to like make money. Yeah. Necessarily. Cause you can't control it at all. Or you, you have very, very little control. Over yeah. It. I, I assume a total loss anytime I cut a check and I'm like, same as you looking for an education, looking to grow the network. And if I get a return, great, which it's worked out. So. And sweet. if you're angel invested in a couple of companies and every once in a while you have a call with these CEOs, it's like your own private little network mm-hmm. of, of stuff. Yeah. So I think that's 
kind of cool and, and worth doing if someone can find the time. But um, but it is difficult to like find companies raising monies that you really are into. Yeah. That, that's why I think being a part of a network, if, especially if you're brand new and you don't have an existing network, like joining an angel investing network will get you access to deal flow. Mm -hmm. And like, you're probably going to want to cut a check on the first pitch you hear because they all sound compelling. They all sound great. Yep. I listened to over 200 pitches before I cut my first check. Really? Yeah. Took me at least two years of listening to pitches because I, I just, I knew how risky it was. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to listen and learn. And then, you know, a couple of times I was ready to write a check and then like the deal got swooped up by a single angel or like, you know, funky shit like that can happen too. So, um, it's a, it's a definitely a good learning process. Cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Chris Dunn, where can people find you? Uh, chrisdunn.com at Chris Dunn TV on all social and yeah, thanks for having me, brother. Check it out. I'm Neville, copywritingcourse.com, at NevMed. Uh, copywriting with a K on YouTube. <laughs> Still held on to that one. Yes, so sir. Maybe we'll change this back to Ks. Hey, maybe, man, I think you should do it. Maybe we'll do it. Oh, you can always keep the, the Cs. It's but... like break it in half on the thing. There you go. We're Ks now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you, man. Have See you, brother. One.